over to you, Elena. Hello, good afternoon, dear audience. We are very happy to have you with us in this incredible session. And it is my pleasure to present you our first speaker, whose name is Ryuki Kasai. He is uh, a founding professor and chair of the Department of Community and Family Medicine at Fukushima Medicine University, Japan. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Japan Primary Care Association and acts as senior advisor of its international committee. Dr. Kasai graduated from Hokkaido University School of Medicine, Sapporo, and completed a residency training in family medicine at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, in British Columbia, in Canada. In 1996, he founded the Hokkaido Center for Family Medicine and started the first formal family medicine training program in Japan. After having made this center a successful model of Japanese residency program, Dr. Kasai moved to Fukushima to found the first medical school department of community-based family medicine in Japan and Fukushima Medical University in 2006. So it's our great pleasure to present you, Professor Yuki Kasai, the Fukushima Medical University Professor and Chair, of the Department of Community and Family Medicine. You are welcome, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. It is a great honor to be speaking to you at the Monka World Conference 2021. I wish I could be in Abu Dhabi today and sincerely hope there will be an opportunity to meet in person at future Wonka conferences. It was March 11th, 2011, when a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and tsunami struck East Japan primarily affecting Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures on the Pacific side of northern Honshu, the main island of Japan. More than 22,000 people died or are still missing, and 347,000 were evacuated, with 40,000 people still displaced, enduring the difficulties of life as an evacuee. Infamously, the tsunami hit the Pacific coastal areas and destroyed the Daiichi nuclear power plant in Fukushima. The reactor lost all the power, including to the cooling mechanisms, bringing it to the verge of meltdown. Eventually, hydrogen explosions caused the meltdown, releasing radioactive materials into atmosphere. After the disaster, on the advice of my colleagues on the International Advisory Board of the BMJ, I started writing blogs. Initially, I wondered how they would turn out, as I'm no Rainer Maria Rilke, perhaps the greatest lyric poet of the 20th century. But I spelled out what came to mind as I lived through the unfolding events. Fortunately, I physically and mentally survived the experience and can now reflect on my thoughts of the day. I'd like to thank my colleagues for suggesting this blogging endeavor and would humbly like to share some of my accounts and subsequent reflections. The first thing that came to my mind was this quote from Hiroshima Note by Nobel Prize winning Japanese novelist Kenzaburo Oe, who reported on the tragedy of the people of Hiroshima after the atomic bombing. I felt like we lost the light and were falling into the darkness. With the infrastructure of daily living suddenly lost, I could neither confirm the safety of my colleagues and trainees dispersed across the region 
nor see the whole picture to comprehend the scale of the damage. The next problem was hospital dysfunction. This was especially pronounced as Japan to this date has been slow to implement primary healthcare policies, meaning the function of medical institutions is poorly differentiated. In the following two to three days, hundreds of patients came to Fukushima Medical University Hospital, either by themselves or in chartered buses from community hospitals and nursing homes in the devastated areas. Many patients were frail, demented, bedridden elderly, often without documentation of their clinical history or circumstances. The supply demand mismatch was tragedy for both sides. For the elderly, re-evacuation to a place of safety became a burden, whereas to the mental well-being of carers was a constant issue. Sometimes it became difficult to keep to our strong Fukushima tradition of endurance and non-blaming culture. At this time, a video clip on, on YouTube entitled Pray for Japan to be strong, be strong moved us to tears. It reminded us how music and shared sharing narratives can he, help to help us to heal. Sadly, for those in evacuation shelters, it wasn't possible to listen to music without bothering others. Instead, they watched TV that repetitiously reported the disaster with tsunami images day and night, further eroding their mental well being. Fukushima has many farmers and fishermen, so our thoughts turned to the risk of contaminated produce, including meat, fish, vegetables, and rice. We wanted to know how to inform local people and support them emotionally in this acute phase of beyond, uh, in, a, in this acute phase and beyond. I still remember the beauty of the snowy white mountains I saw while shivering in the cold. There were 50 people later respectively called the Fukushima 50, made up of the plant director and workers, most of whom were local Fukushima people. They stayed in the disaster and destroyed nuclear plant, working hard to cool the reactors to minimize nuclear contamination in the surrounding area. We need to understand and bridge the knowledge gap between radiation medicine experts and lay people. But it was too big. Rumors were rife, spread maliciously or through lack of knowledge, aggravating fears of future hardship. Cherry blossom or sakura has always been a spiritual flower for Japanese people and continues to occupy a spirit special position in modern consciousness. Since the petals begin to fall only a week after the tree is in full bloom, it was once regarded as a metaphor for samurai warriors who valued a beautiful, honorable death. At the, at the beginning of April 2011, I was sent by the anti-disaster headquarters of Fukushima's prefectural government to command the operation to find and take care of those people left behind in the zone between 20 and 30 kilometers from the damaged nuclear plant. Without sufficient information or health records, we had to visit each house in abandoned communities to see if anyone was left, assess and connect them to medical care as needed. By the end of the two week operation, we had found and taken care of about 400 left behind people, most of whom were frail, elderly and they were disabled. Most of them needed supported, support from basic community services to resume, such as home helpers, balanced meals, bathing, rehabilitation, 
and oral hygiene. Four were admitted to hospital. Even after a year, there was little noticeable reconstruction or reform in Fukushima. And we were keenly aware of our lack of effort. I wanted to rebuild a more sustainable community-based primary health care system along the affected coast of Fukushima through programs of capacity building and social networking. However, it has been difficult for long-term human resources projects like this to attract the support of policymakers, bureaucrats, and the wider Japanese medical community. Many serious things were happening in front of us, and we grew less sensitive to each of them. The Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami wrote about a similar experience after he encountered the great earthquake in Kobe in 1995. Everybody, every day looked like a silent slideshow of disaster images. As I could not break the chain, the numbness I had experienced in the acute phase of the disaster returned. I had focused only on what was in front of me and had a little sensitivity to the misery of the outside world. I thought this was very bad. Looking back, I think I was a little depressed at the time, writing my feelings as blogs and trying to maintain interest in the outside world helped me to overcome this over time. I will never forget the kindness and the encouragement from my friends, especially Wonka colleagues around the world. I'm deeply grateful to two past Wonka presidents, Professor Chris Van Veel and his wife Evelyn, and Professor Michael Kidd, who came in person to Fukushima. Also to Professor Neil Parafox of the University of Hawaii, who gave us his 30 years of hands-on experience in helping people of the Republic of Marshall Islands after US nuclear weapons testing. He even created the opportunity for me to visit the Republic of Marshall Islands to interview the local people and learn from their experiences. The national and Fukushima prefectural governments together launched a thyroid cancer screening program in October 2011 where thyroid ultrasound examinations were provided to children younger than 18 years old who lived in Fukushima at the time of the accident. The program united the needs of scientists to understand the impact of this type of radiation exposure and the public interest in alleviating anxiety by identifying and treating cancers early. More than 80% of the target population of 380,000 children participated in the uh, survey. Unfortunately, significant number of abnormal findings arose with more than 100 children found to have a possible or confirmed malignancy. This led to enormous anxiety and confusion among people in Fukushima causing many to live day to day with an added psychological burden and pessimism about their future. This became an infodemic, resonating with the similar challenges we see today from COVID-19. However, most of these victims were the people of Fukushima. Most thyroid cancers are slow to progress with good prognosis and considerable latency. However, a small proportion of cases can lead to life-threatening cancer. Clinically distinguishing between these groups, deciding whom to treat with the added burdens and side effects is challenging. It is also uncertain whether the cancers identified were in fact caused by the radiation exposure 
as some may well have developed regardless. It is a big controversy, politically as well as scientifically, as to whether this program has resulted in overdiagnosis and potentially unnecessary harmful treatments. Reflecting on this situation, I think that to successfully address the anxieties of people in Fukushima, it was necessary to listen to their concerns in a patient-centered manner, utilizing a shared decision-making approach coupled with an informed discussion on the nature of thyroid cancer, preferably by a primary healthcare team. Every year, as March 11th approaches in Japan, media coverage related to the Great East Japan earthquake increases. As this year marked the 10th anniversary of the disaster, and many more programs were new were, programs and news articles were produced. I found myself getting uncomfortable with the narrative reported. It seems that many media outlets expect expect the victims to have overcome the difficulties and be living with positivity ten years later. They expect the disaster-stricken area to be restored and are reporting according to their expected storylines. However, I don't think their expectations reflect the lived experience and the reality of the victims and affected areas well. Another TV program featured a young victim who lost her family in the tsunami. She said, quote, for five years after the disaster, I was a cheerful and innocent girl, despite my vague knowledge about what had happened to my family. I laughed normally, played joyfully with friends. However, as an evacuee, when I behaved that way, the students at my new school and the TV people who came to interview me looked embarrassed. They said, you are not like a victim. You are too cheerful. As I experienced that over and over again, I became the sad looking girl without laughter that they expected." Unquote. The victims should look sad. The disaster areas should look chaotic. But after catastrophe, the victims lived to the best of their ability. So much suffering compounded by painful depressing experiences made them forget how to smile. But after 10 years, those victims have regained their smile and can positively talk about reconstruction. Many people had this shared illusion about the victims and the disaster areas upon the, the 10th anniversary. Many people in Fukushima have been confused and sometimes frustrated by the gap between that illusion and the reality we face. One Fukushima man said, quote, it's been 10 years, but nothing has changed. Since the disaster, time has stopped, unquote. For Japanese, the experience of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is familiar. We can refer to the reports of the US nuclear weapons testing over the atolls in Marshall Islands and the nuclear accidents at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. But the situation in Fukushima was very different. The amount of radiation emitted into the air was orders of magnitude lower. Nevertheless, the social and psychological damage has been enormous. The trouble is that there is little scientific evidence about the long-term effects of very low dose radiation on the human body and mind. Looking back over the last 10 years, there are still gaps everywhere existing between those who help and those who are helped, between those who report and who are reported about and between those who criticize and who are criticized. It is important for us to better navigate these gaps 
in order to understand each other better. Our background, intention, and illusions are all different. It is difficult to completely close the gap and which side of the gap you find yourself on may change in an instant. Nevertheless, my experiences have taught me that we can still communicate to bridge the gaps between us. I'd like to build a future grounded in context, not buying into the illusion, but one that shares the reality of the others. The world has been, is, and will be full of disasters, earthquakes and tsunami, conflicts and wars, bushfires and floods, and of course, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. As I conclude my reflections on the 10 years since the Great East Japan earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear disaster, I want to leave you one with one last message, translated from Japanese phrase, mochitsu motaretsu, the person who was helped yesterday may be helping someone in another context tomorrow. Finally, let us not forget the importance of music and narratives in healing, as noted by Wilke. I wish good health to you all and hope you stay safe. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Kasai, for this moving presentation. And I would like to uh, remind the audience that we will have the possibility of questions and discussions after the second uh, lecture. But nevertheless, Professor Kasai, this was a very moving and I compliment you again on your marvelous work in leading in Japan through primary care this response to this terrible uh, catastrophe. And catastrophes, as you said, are with us everywhere, also in terms of wars, also in terms of refugees. And that brings us to the next presentation um, on the plight of refugees and their health problems and what better country to turn to because of their experience than Jordan. And when turning to Jordan, whom better to turn to than Dr. Mohamed Razou Tarane? Uh, Professor Dr. Tarane has a vast experience in primary care, bridging more than 25 years uh, in the field of the Royal Medical Services in Jordan as a tutor, a master trainer, an examiner for family medicine, the residency program of the Royal Medical Services. He served on the Royal Medical Council, and he was also a member of the scientific committee of the Faculty of Medicine of Muta University. Currently, he is in private practice as a consultant, but for me, Dr. Mohamed Razou Tarane is also the tireless working past president of the Wonka EMR region. I admire his work very much. And therefore, without much ado, I would like to turn over to Dr. Mohamed Razou Tarane and invite him to give his presentation. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's great pleasure to be with you here in Wonka conference. And I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me and for the effort they uh, did to run this conference. My talk will be about the impact of Syrian refugees on the Jordan health sector, the role of family physicians in Jordan. Let me start from the definition, uh, who is a refugee? A refugee is a person who owned to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, or either some other reasons, who is outside the country of his nationality and, and is unable to or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection. 
Jordan is not a signatory of the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. However, the protection space for refugees in Jordan and asylum seekers is considered vulnerable. Also, Jordan is one of the countries most affected by the Syrian crisis, um, hosting the second highest share of refugees per capita globally. Uh, the slide here shows us that what's the, the global migration crisis. Um, out of 59.5 million, we have 19.5 million refugees all over the world and 10 million are stateless. Where are refugees fleeing from? 53% refugees are worldwide are coming from three countries, Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia. So three countries from our region. The population of concern as for 30 February 2021, and the countries of origin for the origin of the refugees in Jordan is Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, others. We have 57 nationalities that cover the refugees. 83% of them living in urban areas, 17% of refugees living in three major camps in Jordan, Zaatari, Azraq, and Jordan. Um, 51% of refugees under the age of 15. The majority of refugees are women and um, children. Again, Jordan is a major migrant receiving country, and it's also now the top refugee hosting country in absolute numbers, where refugees constitute one third of the total population, in spite of the fact that um, only um, 655,000 are registered in UNHCR. And Jordan has been become a home for several waves of Arab migration since the establishment of Jordan, from the Palestinian refugees to the refugees and other refugees, other waves of refugees. Looking at the population of Jordan, the total population for the um, uh, census 2015 is about 9.5 million and the number of refugees around 3 million. The total number of Syrian refugees in Jordan is 1.3 million. And as I said, those who are registered are less than half of that population. The others are still inside the camp. 90% of Syrian refugees in Jordan are outside camps. Here are, we are showing here the three major camps that the uh, Syrian refugees reside in. One of the uh, biggest camps all over the world is Al Zaatari, where 79,000 uh, Syrian refugees are um, living there, and two other um, major uh, uh, camps. And the show, the slide showed us the increase in the population. And Jordan from 2004 up to 2015 has been almost treble. And the number of the non Jordanians who are living in Jordan is also about 20 times has been increased over the decade. What is the refugees' accessibility to service? There are some accessibility for those who are living outside the camps. And from the beginning of the crisis to 2014, all refugees have free access to all Ministry of Health facilities. But from the middle of 2014, they are dealt with as if all refugees are treated similar to the Jordanians who are not insured. But for those who are living inside the camp, the Ministry of Health and the family physicians there um, uh, supervise and provide all the public health centers. They supervise vaccination, control of infectious disease, uh, drinking water, medical waste, and many other public health issues um, that are supervised by primary health care physicians and family physicians. United Nations Agency and some NGOs provide some basic medical are referred to Minister of Health and some to private hospitals according to the agency's response to their care. The Syrian crisis affects Jordan on different domains, but the mostly affected domain is the health sector, in addition to education, social, economic, and security. One third of um, refugees have been vaccinated in Jordan to the camp of the 47,000 refugees who are eligible for the COVID vaccine. 
the success of the vaccination campaign that have been led by family physician is very much connected to the government's decision to include all persons in Jordan territory, national and refugees. <clears throat> the impact of the refugees in Jordan health sector, many of the indicators had been decreased. Looking at the workforce indicator had been decreased by 30% physician, dentist, nurses, pharmacists per, per population had been decreased. The hospital beds per 10,000 population also had been decreased. The primary health care uh, centers and the family physician clinic also had been decreased according to the huge number and the influx of the Syrian refugees since the, the war crisis. Um, here I'll show some of the health impacts of the Syrian. The major one is the infectious disease. The commonest infectious disease among the refugees that many family physicians and primary healthcare physicians deal with are diarrheal, chickenpox, scabies, uh, bloody diarrhea, hepatitis A, cutaneous leishmaniosis. And there are some um, serious infectious diseases that have been reported among the Syrian refugees. Tuberculosis is one of them. Looking at the number of uh, cases among Jordanian per 100,000 populations around five years of compared to 13 cases among the Syrian. Um, uh, HIV cases, nine cases had been reported and diagnosed, followed up by family physician during the stay. The health impact also on the vaccination and the national immunization program. Poliomyelitis, since 1992, no reported cases of poliomyelitis in Jordan. 30 cases of acute flaccid paralysis were detected by family physician among Syrian refugees during 2013-2017. Uh, measles during 2008-2012, no confirmed measles case among the uh, children, but due to the Syrian influx and the Syrian refugees, um, uh, 51 cases among the refugees have been reported. So there should be a response for this. The MOH response led by family physician is to conduct vaccination campaign. Um, nine vaccination campaigns have been uh, conducted to cover the measles, polio, and to uh, one campaign, huge national campaign that covered 10 uh, vaccines according to national immunization program. There are some impacts due to the crisis itself, war related trauma, amputations, bullet injuries, burn. All of these had been built and referred to the secondary care when it deals with family physician. And the major um, aspects of um, health service that um, affected the Syrian refugees is the mental health disorder, like post traumatic stress disorders, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Um, the other aspect is the non-communicable disease like diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, renal failure. 100 cases had been registered and followed up uh, post-care um, uh, post by family physician. Cancer cases, thalassemia, 2,270 cases had been. Seven cases of um, phenylketonurium had been diagnosed and followed up by a primary health care and family physician in the PSC city. At the maternal and child health service, which almost in Jordan run by family physician, female family physician, there is an increased demand on antenatal care, postnatal care, child care, family planning, keeping in mind that all MCH services in Jordan are provided by family physician to refugees for uh, free. The slide showing the utilization of Minister of Health facilities uh, by the Syrian refugees, how the number is uh, increased, the number of refugees attended the hospitals, those who are attended the primary health care um, uh, centers uh, had been increased during the period of uh, the influx. And this is show how they are this, this, the most affected governor rates in Jordan by at least 10% uh, of, of the uh, Syrian patient had been visited as some kind of um, healthcare facilities, either primary healthcare center or family medicine clinic or even hospitals. 
and this is affected by the, the hospitals. Some hospitals have been 20% uh, uh, of their attendants are uh, uh, Syrian. Those uh, hospitals with no far from the border with Syria, mostly affected by the Syrian refugees as well. The, the impact on the quality of, of health service, um, um, the index went down by 12 points. And this is showed us the longer waiting list and please the primary health care setting adverse affected on the quality of service that heavily affected the uh, and there are more complaints and dissatisfaction by the, uh, the by the patient due to this huge number of activities the the health care utilization by person amongst Syrian refugees is twice um, uh, as the Jordanian so Syrian refugees utilize health services uh, more than Jordanian according to the study done the Minister of Health for the cost and financial impact of expanding insurance coverage. So Jordan developed Jordan response plan where the major player in this plan are primary care and family physician with three major objectives, increased access, uptake and quality of primary, secondary and tertiary health care for Jordanians and Syrian refugees in an impacted area strengthening access uptake and the quality of integrated community interventions for Jordanian and Syrian and strengthening adaptive capacity of the national health system to address current and future um, stresses. There are some of the projects that have been developed in the primary healthcare setting that are strengthening and expanding the program of uh, immunization, uh, sustain the quality of environmental health and medical waste and capacity building is one of the major issues that family business played a big role in, in this by training and increasing the capacity of health assistant and health staff. So the major two roles in the family business that played is the access, uptake, and quality of primary care uh, provided to the civilian refugees, uh, strengthening the access and uptake of the integrated community intervention that uh, the most the team, the community. Uh, team is head by family uh, physicians in Jordan. So uh, the approach that uh, used and followed up by the family physician in Jordan is a smart approach, smart uh, approach that had been a little bit modified by the uh, Jordan Society of Family Physician and the Primary Health Care Administration is for screening in the primary care setting and the family medicine clinic and the refugees are screened. Um, uh, for physical health, social, um, and other uh, issue, and mental health, and other needs. The second uh, step is the management. They are managed um, all the conditions and the situation for these um, um, and had been managed. Um, some additional training of the, the clinician and staff um, or um, on some on-site resources for patients. A for assist. The uh, primary care physician assist refugees um, patient of, um, in effective, effective navigating resources in the community and understanding um, local policies and benefits. Um, refer um, they refer um, refugees um, patient to external agencies if needed that may provide more comprehensive physical, mental, and social um, support. A team. The primary care setting coordinate a team of um, partners that can collectively offer comprehensive service to uh, refugees, patients, and their families, and uh, meet a wide spectrum of their um, In summary, the occurrence of certain communicable diseases among the refugees, which oblige emerge to conduct frequent vaccination, have been uh, increasing. The prevention control monitoring activities of uh, some specific community and monitoring control of um, MCH services, antenatal care, postnatal care, and obstetric service. There was a demand and pressure on the school health services that provided to refugee students because this kind of service almost um, run by family. Uh, physician. 
the continuous provision and monitoring of specific public health services related to safe drinking water, uh, medical waste, uh, and other issues of other public health um, issues. Um, as I said, there, there is increasing of um, the occupancy rate in hospital by 20%, uh, pressure on the provision of um, therapeutic service by 20%, uh, pressure on medical equipment, uh, cost, high cost of investigation for some specific diseases by laboratory, a high consumption rate of medical and non-medical consumables by 30%, high uh, consumption rate of medication by 20%, the effect of the psychological, physical, social, and emotional burden on medical care is all in this article. Um, uh, I will end, finish my talk by some key message that um, Jordan remains committed to provide humanitarian aid to Syrian refugees. Uh, Jordan can no longer be alone the financial impact of the crisis. Uh, Jordan public health system is dangerously overstrict, especially that Jordan no more eligible for Gavi crisis means for the vaccination to cope with its national vaccination program. Uh, Jordan needs a significant contribution from the international community to sustain its health services for Jordanians and Syrian refugees alike. Jordan needs to build the capacity of health workforce in terms of training and scholarship so that it can cope with the refugees' uh, impact. By this, I end my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarone, uh, for this moving experience from a country so long caring for huge groups of refugees. Uh, we are now coming to the possibility of um, questions and discussion. I, I hope I get a message of how much time we still have with us here. Um, the um, not seeing any questions yet on the Q&A, I probably would like to ask you a question, both of you. Um, and my question would be, both of you have experienced the situation of a of crisis, and crisis is something you uh, you're not prepared for. You you have to step in. Um, both of you have lived through it, and we are here in an international conference uh, with many other countries trying to benefit from your experience. Can you enlighten us first on, is there anything you see how primary care can see as a, 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 as a message from your presentations, how as a profession, how as a discipline, we can be prepared to cope with crisis or which elements that we have regularly in primary care are particularly relevant to uh, to 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 make available in communities hit by crisis hit by a, a catastrophe um, may i ask professor kasai to start with his thoughts and then come to dr taravane Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this question. And I think uh, the um, advantage or privilege of a primary health care uh, team and uh, family doctors uh, is to take care not only if, of uh, the acute uh, phase of uh, the care, uh, but also on the uh, continuing uh, the long-term uh, care after uh, the acute uh, phase. And uh, so we can uh, address uh, uh, the issues in both uh, 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 both groups of uh, uh, the problems. But the problem is uh, uh, we, we have uh, the regular uh, work uh, without disaster. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, the disaster happened, and uh, we ourselves uh, become uh, 
uh, victims uh, uh, as well. So we have it uh, all of a sudden uh, we had to do uh, two things. One is to overcome uh, the difficulties in my life or in my uh, uh, the uh, very uh, proximal uh, context issues, but also uh, uh, we need to uh, address uh, the other uh, address uh, uh, the problems uh, happened uh, by the uh, disasters. So uh, this is a uh, very uh, difficult. And so uh, the basic uh, uh, wisdom will be uh, to be prepared uh, always and what would happen, but uh, the sometimes it's quite difficult. And probably you're saying as well that to be effective as primary care, we as primary care professionals should be supported and happy and uh, healthy and protected for the impact such uh, experiences has the, have directly on us. Mm. Is that yeah? Yes. Which yeah. Um, Dr. Tarana, um, maybe you can share your uh, views on this, and you have uh, virtually an ongoing crisis with refugees uh, that over time change and still have their impact. Um, how do you, what, what do you think the world can learn from what primary care has gone through in the past decades in Jordan? Well, thank you. Uh, um, thank you, um, Sam. Um, really, um, the Jordan health system um, and the primary health care particularly um, had been tested by the uh, influx of uh, refugees. And, and by the way, continues continue is under testing where um, family physicians um, are the uh, leader and they, they can utilize many of their um, attributes in um, uh, dealing with the um, huge influx of uh, patients within uh, a short um, time. They, they, they are the, the uh, one who can easily engage in the community and uh, facilitate community participation. Um, they are, um, uh, I mean, primary care setting are the, the place where um, uh, all, all patients can uh, get an easy um, uh, access um, uh, anytime. Um, the, the, the most important thing that um, uh, is the, they are the one who are familiar with the cultural background of uh, refugees it could be uh, not that uh, so difficult with the Syrian refugees, but I, when I mentioned in mind, 75 nationalities with different culture, different backgrounds from different countries. Um, so um, uh, focusing on um, the, 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 the culture of, uh, of, uh, of uh, refugees is very important to look, um, particularly when it comes to uh, mental effect of the um, um, crisis. So to summarize that, um, I think um, uh, we can build on the experience that um, primary care physicians gain through this um, uh, unfortunate um, uh, crisis is uh, to be a, a good leader when, when they lead a team and the um, one who can use uh, time and limited um, resources efficiently are, uh, I think that's things that we can uh, build on. But in, in general, um, I think primary care in peaceful time is very far different from primary care in emergency. Uh, I think that we have to work on in our residency program training curriculum to put them uh, what, what is the best way and how um, to deal with um, uh, some um, uh, diseases that had been neglected. Example is... Um, Continuous Leishmanians, Leishmanians hadn't been um, diagnosed in Jordan for many years. The same with polio, which is eradicated, but um, they have to know it again when the crisis starts. So a lot of um, uh, lessons that can be learned to our undergraduate, to our um, junior uh, family physician from this um, crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm 
still looking at the and inviting the uh, those who are on the audience to pose questions through the Q and A. Not seeing that and wanting to continue this interesting discussion, um, both of you have mentioned the uh, the interaction with the victims, uh, not just as patients but also as as individuals as as communities. How effective is it in a situation of crisis to liaise to and work with the actual population of what we then call the victims, the ones who uh, are at the uh, receiving end of the, the crisis to involve them at that moment during crisis? Um, has that been possible? Is that because it's such a powerful mechanism in community-based primary care in, in, in general, is that under crisis and catastrophe also a possibility? Um, can both of you give a short reflection on that? And maybe we start with uh, Dr. Tarawane. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question that uh, Sean from um, experience um, when, when a family physician uh, deals with um, victims, they look uh, at the all aspect of uh, health and non-health issue, not direct health issue, not only the physical aspects of um, their health, also at the um, social um, um, aspects and um, um, even at the financial aspects of their um, uh, uh, conditions. So this is... Um, uh, uh, encouraged and pushed family visit to look for with, to look for a, a cooperation with other uh, um, um, NGOs or, soci or uh, civil uh, societies that um, they can um, arrange um, some kinds of help in terms of housing, in terms of uh, 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 other things uh, uh, related to the uh, um, their help and in, in, in directly. So this again and um, encourage the family position to be um, completely familiar with the communities where they, where they, with whom do they work. Uh, and even among the group and uh, of victims or inside the camps, they have to be familiar with uh, um, respected or well-known victims who can help them in terms of the background of the victims and um, what things that um, concern them more than um, others. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Professor Kasai, your, your comments as well, but you also have a question directly to you on the Q&A, um, asking you uh, about what, uh, what you've learned of being prepared and what sp specific preparations have you started working um, um, to prepare doctors for the next disaster. Um, of course, in the situation you faced, it was a, a sudden on catastrophe. Um, no one had seen coming. And uh, how do you prepare future doctors for it? And particularly given in the situation you were facing where probably the health problems were only a minor part of the problems people were facing. They lost their house, they lost their jobs, they lost their income. Um, uh, here we see primary health care at its full breadth and acting outside the borders of strict borders of, of health care and medicine. Uh, it's, a, it's a long and a complex question, but I'm certain you have something valuable to, to, to see and particularly address the question that is on the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Um... The, I think uh, the Japanese situation is a very complex, uh, but uh, most of all, uh, the primary health care uh, implementation uh, is quite uh, uh, underdeveloped uh, in Japan. And uh, 10 years ago, oh, we didn't have a... a, a Good systems of primary health care in any uh, affected areas, and uh, then uh, the Japan Primary Health um, Japan uh, Primary Care Association 
so which is the uh, member organization of Wonka, uh, have uh, have addressed uh, the several uh, projects, and now uh, we have uh, the some uh, the teaching modules for uh, the future uh, family doctors in Japan. So this is off the off the job uh, training uh, modules for uh, the trainees, as well as uh, we have a team to uh, be sent uh, if uh, some uh, something happened to the uh, disaster uh, stricken areas. So uh, those activities organized by uh, the Japanese uh, association uh, is the one uh, example of uh, preparedness. But uh, the uh, the basic uh, basic uh, um, the fundamental uh, issues uh, uh, one of the, the issues is the how to uh, how to persuade uh, the government uh, to take uh, primary health care uh, as an uh, the strong uh, uh, weapon or tool uh, or solution to uh, address uh, the disaster uh, health. Okay. There is a question from Dr. Sonia Wicklum in the Q&A for both of you. I think it more or less covered what you, uh, Professor Kasai, were just referring to, but if you can have a look, and then probably I can also ask, because I suspect we're running a bit towards the end of the session, also, Dr. Tarane, to uh, comment on that, a uh, response team as a matter of, as, as a way of keeping the experience alive and making it available for the, for the future. Well, thank you. Thank you. And in, in a very short, um, I will reflect on the previous question because um, um, one of the lessons learned that is to integrate uh, mental health health in primary health care. So this is what we started and we are building on and expanding in, in the family practice curriculum. Um, the second, as you mentioned, is the uh, team response. Um, we are working on building uh, the capacities of family physicians uh, to, to build and uh, to lead the team and uh, keeping the team in primary health care system um, in, in, in a wake-up manner, that um, to uh, check for any 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 anything that is that had been defaulted or not working on as a weakness point. So team building building is now an area that we are working on and building the capacities in all the primary healthcare centers um, as one of uh, things that um, uh, uh, have tackled some weakness. Thank you. Okay. Um, Professor Kasai, um, did you ha do you have anything to add to the question of Dr. Sonia Wicklum? Yeah, uh, the speaking of uh, cultural uh, knowledge and cultural understandings. So uh, I would use, uh, I used uh, the word, uh, uh, the context, uh, and uh, we need to understand the context of uh, each uh, people uh, who have had a unique uh, experiences uh, over uh, the acute phase of uh, disaster. So we need to uh, 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 listen carefully uh, to uh, that uh, context uh, issues. Okay, so I, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you because I'm signaled that I have to round up this session and I don't want to let it slip away. Uh, I want to thank both of you for your presentations. I think these were moving examples of the value of primary care operating under unpredictable circumstances and not fully supported by governments in the way primary care should be supported. Thank you very much for this. I thank the audience for their listening and for the questions. And I think I should now round off this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.